Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, co-host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report podcast, and today is March the 15th, 2024. It has been 3,700 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 24 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, and 2 years and 21 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression. Today's podcast looks at events that happened on Thursday and Friday morning. During the podcast, you will find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. A link is in the podcast description, and there are map updates. The Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine Morning Reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, the truth, because the truth matters. Here is the daily assessment. 1. Ukraine handed the Putin regime a political defeat by preventing Russian forces from achieving their operational goals before the start of the sham presidential elections. 2. Based on statements made by Russian President Vladimir Putin and his proxies, the world remains in the early stages of the mutually assured destruction and stability paradox. 3. The United States House of Representatives will not advance a bill that will provide additional financial and military aid to Ukraine unless there is an unforeseen event that changes congressional leadership before the 2024 elections. 4. In our assessment, Russia maintains the initiative theater-wide, but the second phase of the 2024 winter offensive is reaching its culmination point. 5. In our assessment, Ukraine's shift to a Fabian strategy to wear down Russian combat power has been effective. 6. We maintain that the delay in the shipment of critically needed artillery rounds from the Czech Republic-led ammunition initiative will force Ukraine to reduce the number of fire missions. 7. We maintain that Russia has significantly improved its intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities ISR, and fire control, enabling more successful attacks against mobile targets. 8. While the possibility of an intentional nuclear accident caused by Russian occupiers at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains low, the condition is more serious than what the International Atomic Energy Agency is reporting. 9. Russian-aligned assets have co-opted the ongoing Polish border blockade, which has become an open act of hybrid warfare against Ukraine and the Baltic states. We begin today's war report in Kharkiv and Luhansk oblasts, beginning in the Kupinsk area of operation, also known as NAO. There were only Russian reports of fighting in the areas of Sinkivka, south of Pershatravneva and east of Tabaevka. The Kharkiv Oblast administrative and military governor Oleksiy Nyohubov reported that Russia used Shahed-136 one-way drones to target television and radio broadcast infrastructure across the Kharkiv Oblast. Repair work was ongoing, with radio and TV knocked out in several rayons. In our assessment, the strikes, which also occurred in the Sumy Oblast, are an attempt by Moscow to tighten control of the information space in Bryansk, Kursk and Belgorod, where ongoing fighting between free Russian liberation and pro-Putin Russian forces continues. In the Kremenaya of Luhansk Oblast, Russian forces continued their offensive operations east of Terny and Yampolivka. We moved the line of conflict away from Terny after reviewing two geolocated videos, which confirmed that fighting had moved east. The first showed an abandoned Swedish-provided Stridsvagen 122 main battle tank destroyed by a Russian first-person view FPV one-way drone. The second showed a Russian BMP infantry fighting vehicle destroyed by a T-62 anti-tank landmine. 
we link to both videos and many of the videos and pictures I mention in our situation report. There is more information on how to become a subscriber in the podcast description. We are making a change to the areas of operation and placing Belohorivka and Zolotarivka in Luhansk Oblast in the Siversk EO. Ukraine hasn't made an advance in the direction of Lysychansk since November 2022, and this better reflects the operational situation. On the subject of the Siversk EO, Russian forces attempted to advance on Belohorivka from the southeast without success. Russian sources reported that on March the 13th, a training base in occupied Trehizbenka was hit by rockets fired by HIMARS, killing at least 10 soldiers. We cannot verify the number of casualties. Here is what's happening in the Donbass, starting in northeast Donetsk Oblast. In the Solidario, Russian attacks on Rozdolivka were repulsed. Further south, in the Bakhmutio, Russian attempts to advance toward Bogdanivka failed. Fighting continued in Ivanivske, with the Ukrainian forces holding their defensive positions. In the Klishivka AO, positional fighting continued north and east of Klishivka, with no change in the situation. And in the Toretsk New York AO, the Russian Ministry of Defense, Armored, continued its claims that there is ongoing fighting in the area of Shumy and Pivdenne. In southwest Donetsk Oblast, Russia continues its attacks in the Avdivka AO, which remain intense but have become ad hoc and disjointed. Just like in the Shumy area, Armod repeated its claim that fighting was ongoing near Novo Bakhmutivka. We continue to see no evidence of significant fighting in the area. Russian attacks, mostly involving light infantry, continued across the Ukrainian defensive line that runs from Berdyche, Semenivka, Orlivka and Tonenka. Russian forces broke through the line south of Berdyche, but were pushed back by the Ukrainian 47th Mechanized Infantry Brigade. 35 Russian soldiers were killed, and a search of their military IDs revealed that some had been mobilized as recently as March the 5th. Yes, from mobilization to a zinc coffin in eight days. For the south, Armand reported fighting restarted in Vodyane. Fighting continued within Pervomaiske and near the Ukrainian firebase at Nevelske. The reduction in Russian combat potential and the slightly improved artillery situation have enabled Ukrainian commanders to rotate combat ineffective and combat destroyed units from the forwardmost line of friendly troops. If successfully executed, the situation should stabilize further. Historically, Russian President Vladimir Putin has fixated on dates. The start of the next Russian offensive could be May the 1st, May the 7th, which is Putin's inauguration day, or May the 9th, which is victory day. Heavy fighting continued in the Vogledario. Russian troops shifted their attacks on Krasnogorivka, attempting to advance from the northeast. Fighting continued on the eastern edge of Georgievka and the southwestern edge of Pobeda. Ukrainian forces have stabilized their defensive lines in Novomikhailovka, but the situation remains difficult. The Ukrainian 46th Air Assault Brigade reported that Russia had improved fire control on the O-532 highway between Kostantinivka and Vogledar. Russian forces made marginal gains north of Shevchenko in a tree line. At the time of recording, it was unclear if they were able to consolidate their gains. In the Staromlinivka AO, mutual fighting was reported in the area of Staromayorske, with no change in the situation. One last thing. A geolocated video confirmed that the March 13th Russian attack near Priyutne failed. In Zaporizhia Oblast, fighting continued in the Urikhiv AO. Russian forces continued their attacks west and northwest of Verbove. A geolocated video showing a failed Russian attack confirmed there has been no change to the line of conflict or the gray area. Russian forces continued their attempts to push into Robotene from the west and south without success. Near occupied Vysoka, a Russian RB-301B Borisoglebsk-2 electronic warfare complex was destroyed. We've got the video, and you can find it in our sitrap.
The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant monitors with the International Atomic Energy Agency successfully rotated through the Kaminska checkpoint. It was also reported that the 330 kV external power backup line from the Zaporizhia thermal power plant was restored after being disconnected for 23 days. The situation along the Russian front remains dynamic, and efforts by the Kremlin to cover up the situation aren't going to plan. The Pervy Zavod AV Bot 101 oil refinery, south of Palatnyane Zavod in the Kaluga region of Russia, was hit by up to three Ukrainian one way drones. It is the largest refinery in the Kaluga region, capable of processing 1.2 million metric tons of oil per year. Regional governor Vladislav Shapsha claimed that all four drones that targeted the plant were shot down. We link to the video that shows that the oil refinery was used to intercept at least one drone that just missed the distillation tower. Another editorial note. Because the fighting in Kursk and Belgorod is spilling over into the Sumer Oblast, we will start including reports from Sumer in the Russian front section. In the Sumer Oblast of Ukraine, a third body has been found in the collapsed five-story apartment building in Sumer, which was hit by a Shahed-136 one-way drone on March the 12th. And what about the missile and drone strikes in Sumer, Shostka, Bilopilia and Trostanets I told you about yesterday? They targeted radio, television and cellular phone infrastructure. Work was ongoing to restore communications. Like in Kharkiv Oblast, in our assessment this is an attempt to control the information space within Russia, as all four areas are located close to the Russian border. Pro-Putin Russian forces conducted 77 fire missions targeting 11 settlements in Sumy Oblast, using artillery rounds, mortars, Grad rockets and one-way drones. In Luhivka, about 5 km from the Russian border, the VKS, Russian Aerospace Forces, bombed the bridge over the Vorskla river. The 16 residents of the village, mostly old ladies, were forced to evacuate with no viable route left to the village. Free Russian Liberation Forces had advanced into Spadarushina, Belgorod, Russia, which is accessed through the road that connects Pupivka to Luhivka, Ukraine. The destruction of the bridge was a defensive measure by pro-Putin forces. You don't blow up bridges to slow down in advance when you are… let me check my notes… here it is… winning. Residents in Ryzhivka, Ukraine, reported that pro-Putin forces had destroyed the village, which has been under continuous shelling. Speaking with Ukrainian state media source Suspilne, a resident said, quote, All the windows and doors in the house are broken. We have been sitting in the cellar for the third night. From today there is no water or gas. A projectile hit the well, and it was filled up. We have about 12 people left on the street. Unquote. The remaining residents have been under a mandatory evacuation order since last year, and all signed waivers to remain in the village. Local officials say it is impossible to reach Rizhivka due to the continued shelling and a request to the Red Cross to coordinate a green corridor went unanswered. Because of course it did. The main defense intelligence directorate of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, UHUR, accused pro-Russia forces of blocking civilian evacuations in Kursk and Belgorod and using residents as human shields. Local residents accused pro-Putin forces of surrounding transportation hubs and setting up roadblocks. The Freedom of Russia Legion, LSR, and Russian Volunteer Corps, RDK, and the Siberian Battalion, referred to as the Free Russian Liberation Forces, issued an appeal to the governors of the Kursk and Belgorod regions to announce immediate evacuation orders. Quote, Civilians should not suffer from the war, and any casualties during the fighting will be on the conscience of Roman Starovoit and Vyacheslav Gladkov. We demand that governors stop carrying out the criminal orders of the Putin regime and not interfere with the evacuation of civilians from the combat zone, who themselves have already decided to leave their homes and save the lives of their families. 
the operation to liberate the Kursk and Belgorod regions will continue until all goals are achieved. Unquote. The Free Russian Liberation Forces then announced the creation of a green corridor over a 200-kilometer stretch of Kursk and Belgorod from 2100 hours local time to 0700 hours on March the 15th. Quote, After that, we will launch a massive attack on Putin's military in the population center. Unquote. At the time of the recording, they followed through with the notice, with heavy shelling starting. With questions still swirling on how much combat is ongoing within Russia, a representative from the RDK told Suspilne that detailed information wasn't shared to support operational security and not, quote, inside enemy fire. Volunteers from Ichkeria, the region mostly known by its Russian name Chechnya, have entered the fight on the side of the Free Russian Liberation Forces. In the video announcing their presence, they called upon the peoples of the Caucasus to, quote, get up from their knees and for their independence. There is significant fog of war in the CEO, with both combatants implementing major psychological warfare operations as part of their strategy. Our analyst team is doing their best to find the truth. Which is why the last three podcasts have been combat only. In the Kursk region, fighting restarted in the southern part of Tyotkina. The video was geolocated 2.5 kilometers over the Russian border, and the second pro-Putin vehicle carrying small arms ammunition appears to have been hit by a rocket-propelled grenade fired from within the settlement. Based on that information, we adjusted the map to show free Russian forces are deeper in Tyutkina than yesterday. In the Belgorod region, Armut claimed that 30 free Russian liberation forces were killed in Spodarushina, and another 20 who came to retrieve the dead were eliminated. They released, then deleted, a video as their proof. The video is either fake or misattributed, because the troops in the video have yellow friend or foe identity markings. The Free Russian Liberation Forces wear blue or have no markings. We've said that Moscow produces a lot of propaganda. We didn't say it was quality propaganda. Fighting continued in Kozinka, with Belgorod governor Gladkov claiming that he toured the village and it, quote, was hit hard, the destruction was serious. Free Russian Liberation Forces released a video showing Chechen Ahmad soldiers, who had been moved up to the line of conflict and ran from the fighting, being hit by artillery fire. Russian state media agency RT went to Graivaran and reported that people were evacuating the settlement with long lines forming at area gas stations. The video was deleted, and then Governor Gladkov said that residents could be picked up at a special place located north of the settlement. Later, Gladkov released pictures of area residents being processed into a temporary shelter, indicating that evacuation efforts are more organized than reported. Providing more information, a resident drove through Graivaran, showing houses on fire and destroyed vehicles, declaring, quote, We are fucked here. The city of Belgorod was heavily shelled on March the 14th, with pro-Putin forces claiming the artillery rounds and Grad rockets were being fired from Ukraine. As we have previously assessed, that is impossible unless free Russian forces have advanced 10 to 15 kilometers toward the city. Air raid sirens have run almost constantly since March the 12th, and the first day of voting in the sham elections was disrupted. Governor Gladkov ordered most shopping malls and markets to shut down through March the 17th. In our assessment, free Russian liberation forces occupy Kozinka, and fighting continues in Spodarushina and near Shebekina. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers, and analysts is funded by readers, listeners, and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News.
Here is my theater-wide update. On March the 13th and the 14th, Russia launched 36 Shahed-136 one-way drones at targets in Ukraine, with 22 shot down. Russia is suspected of jamming the GPS and communication signals of an airplane carrying British Minister of Defense Grand Shapps on a return flight from Poland. The blackout lasted 30 minutes while the plane was near the enclave of Kaliningrad. NATO Alliance doctrine does not consider GPS jamming an act of war. President of France Emmanuel Macron gave a 36-minute interview making the strongest statement ever by a Western European leader in support of Ukraine and the need to prepare for a continental war. The French president was repeatedly questioned if he would rule out sending troops to Ukraine. Quote, You're sitting in front of me. Are you standing? No. Are you ruling out standing up at the end of this interview? Of course, you're not going to rule it out. Unquote. Pushed further on what would trigger sending troops to Ukraine, Macron said, quote, Today we are not in a situation where it is necessary to send troops to Ukraine, but we do not rule out such a scenario. He also said, quote, There will be no peace if Russia wins, and peace is not the surrender of Ukraine, and that a Russian victory in Ukraine presents an existential threat to Europe and France. We link to the entire interview that has been translated into English using AI in our CTRAP. After meeting with the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington, D.C., the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs Josep Borrell said, quote, The next months will be decisive. Many analysts expect a major Russian offensive this summer, and Ukraine cannot wait until the result of the next US elections. Speaking to reporters Wednesday night, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson said he would, quote, work to get the House to agree on a resolution to support Ukraine. No one wants Vladimir Putin to take the mountain. I think he will not stop at Ukraine and will go further to Europe. In this situation, there is a right and a wrong side, good against evil, and Ukraine is a victim here, unquote. Johnson's proposal is based on a high interest loans or restoring the Land Lease Act, which Senate leaders have said would be dead on arrival. The scheme was introduced by the presumptive Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Earlier in the week, Senator Minority Leader Mitch McConnell dismissed the idea of a new bill, saying there wasn't enough time. White House National Security Communications adviser John Kirby told reporters, quote, we believe that the bill passed in the Senate adequately addresses our strong desire to continue to support Ukraine. It responds well to the needs of Ukraine's defense, as well as Israel's defense, and other issues of our national security around the world. So, we continue to urge Speaker Johnson to bring this bill to the floor, vote on it, and move on. We know that if there is an opportunity to vote, it has strong support from both parties." Unquote. Ukraine and Latvia have started negotiations on security guarantees, joining Japan, the United States, Romania, Norway, Spain, Finland and the European Union. Sweden is joining the Czech Republic-led ammunition initiative and plans to allocate $33 million. Parliament will have to approve the request. Bulgaria reported that the first BTR-60 armored personnel carriers they donated have arrived in Ukraine and the remaining 70 are in transit. In previous sitraps, we have dismissed the BTR-60 as a poorly designed Cold War-era relic with fatal flaws. After talking to experts, we learned that Ukraine has expertise in modernizing and improving BTR-60s and is capable of addressing many of its issues. Progress of both discharge petitions to force a vote on military aid for Ukraine stalled out. Discharge Petition 9, led by Jim McGovern, still has 177 signatures, all from Democrats. Discharge Petition 10, led by Brian Fitzpatrick, has 14 signatures, 8 from Republicans and 6 from Democrats. 33 members of the House Ukrainian Support Caucus have not signed either petition. And that's what we know. Join me again on Monday, and I hope you have a pleasant weekend. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history.
and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.